Good morning, everyone. Slido, we had a Slido code for your questions. I hope it will appear on the screen any moment so that you can ask whatever interests you. From the lab to the consumer, yes, Vilnius 700. Uh, the transition from new ideas uh, to products uh, will be of great concern in this discussion. I have a great product, why is nobody interested? Is the line that oftentimes comes up uh, from startups and uh, uh, different entities who innovate. What do we do about this? Uh, we will talk today with two prominent uh, men who argue that we need to bring businesses, uh, business aspects into science earlier on, that's one. Uh, we need to think differently about policies too, and we need systems that make our supply chains move forward. And maybe even we need uh, economic frameworks to evolve to become more interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. Uh, so, a professor in the Agricultural and Resource Economics Department at the University of California, Berkeley, Wolf Prize uh, in Agriculture uh, 2009 winner, David Zilberman, and a prominent scientist, biochemist, former CEO, now uh, chairman of the board of Thermo Fisher Scientific Baltics, Algimantas Markauskas. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here with us. Mr. Zilberman, you have written uh, papers to analyze the, the topic, the transition from new ideas to final marketed products, uh, you have argued that the transition is done through two supply chains, innovation supply chain, right, and the product supply chain. This is theory, but from your perspective, where does the very problem lie when we talk about the transition from ideas to products, and maybe you could also explain this theory in greater detail to okay. us. Oh, uh, thank you. It's a real, uh, real pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, my ancestor came from Vilnius, and no one told me that it's such a wonderful city. I'm <laughs> really glad uh, to be here. So I, I, the, I've been working for several years on uh, this trying to introduce new technologies, for example, uh, hydrogen or biofuel. And I realized that uh, standard economic models have a lot of uh, problems. They were developed for the 18th century, where you have uh, very little technological trend and a lot of competition, and products were very homogeneous. But they don't really fit the 21st century, where you have uh, a, lo a lot of innovation, new companies all the time, a lot of uh, monopolies. So to me, we have to rethink our economic analysis. And the two key elements are innovation, the new ideas, and supply chain. And there are two types of supply chain, supply chain of innovations and supply chain of products. Supply chain of innovation includes several things. Creation of innovation, development of innovation, upscaling of innovation. There are several ways to do it. It can be done what I call the educational industrial complex, like in the US, in California. University come with the product, startup upgrade it, someone even commercialize it, and then entrepreneur move to product supply chain. Another type of innovation supply chain is a recombinant system that you have people that come with an idea and develop a supply chain using the best technology to develop. Would you give uh, examples of that? Uh, the best example is uh, the way Edison works or, uh, or the way that Ford works. Tesla? How did Ford work? No new ideas. It took technology from singers, a sewing machine, and from, uh, and from the way that they uh, produce uh, food, and, and, and he moved it to automobiles. Mm. So to some extent, moving ideas from one area to another is one thing. On the other hand, if you look at biotechnology, someone discovers the DNA, then someone discovers mechanisms to do GMO, and then someone discovers product. The best idea is how they found the vaccine. So these are two different systems. But once you have a product, then the role of entrepreneur is to commercialize it. And what the entrepreneurs try to do, they think dynamically, they have to decide about three things, where to start, what would be the scale of operation, how much to do it in-house and out of house, how much will be vertical integration, how much will be uh, through contracting. Now, again, pricing the old-fashioned market it's not that significant. It's significant in mm. grain, but the way Apple operates, 
they have a contract, they tell you exactly what they want to produce. The way that almost every company operates, everything is built on contracting, so we need to introduce it to our theory. But the key point is, when you have a new company, generally it tends to be monopolistic and monopsonistic. No one will develop a product without thinking about profit. You can say that profit is a problem, and I'm an environmental economist, so I believe that you need to regulate profit and to deal with greed, greed and the government have a role. But you have to recognize that you need to have monopolies. Now it's a good, but what about excess monopoly? Of course, you need to develop an element that you can enter to industry. Barriers to industry are terrible. So th the role is not to prevent monopolies, but to prevent static system. What is the key element to, to stop monopolies? Is to have educational system and universities. If you look at it, Stanford produced a, a company a, called Yahoo, if you remember, and Yahoo was killed by Google, and Google will be killed too. I don't give them <laughs> many, uh, many years too, if you have good universities. Now, that's the reason when I think about a country like Lithuania, I say, gosh, why don't you have a university of the Baltic and one of the billionaires, and you have a billionaire, take $2 billion and start to say, okay, let's develop the University of Williams, and Williams will be the center. Instead of sending students to England, they will send it here. It's not that difficult to do it. I, I see how Berkeley operates. You take uh, rich people and they start something and around the university you have an industrial plant and that's the way to go and it will be a regional effort. You can have in Vilnius one thing and you have something in Riga and all together you need to develop an industrial complex. Now, the other thing about science and then I, is that when you develop it, you think now about multidisciplinary things. You cannot really think about one discipline at a time. To me, most of the work that happened in Water, climate change, etc., require that economics, economists know biology, biologists know economics, business people mix the two. Right? Having people that are specialized in one thing is not that useful. So, to me, thinking about innovation, supply chain, and multidisciplinary mm -hmm. thought can really change the way you think about the, the, the humanity or economy. Mr. Markowskis, would you also agree with the uh, academic aspect uh, that was mentioned that we need to bring a business, uh, we need to bring science, the business aspects into science earlier on, and that, you know, startups and uh, businesses, SMEs, don't do that? Yeah, I absolutely agree 100% uh, what David uh, just uh, said, right, about uh, uh, necessity, first of all, to have uh, a holistic view, right, on the, on the business process when you start really kind of uh, come to idea, commercialize, right, certain uh, innovation or, or, or research product, right? So, so um, and um, probably everyone agree and everyone uh, 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 really understands what, what's important, what's, but how practically, right, to achieve that. That's typically an uh, issue, right? And, uh, and, uh, and the thing is, right, uh, um, in many cases I see um, researchers, uh, say, making startups, uh, uh, they seek for a capital, and, and, and the problem is they go to the wrong place for a capital, right? Because the thing is, right, nothing worse than to have an impatient investor which don't understand your product and your market. Mm. Trust me, right? When 80% of your time will be dedicated to relationship <laughs> management, right? Mm. Not, the, not your product development, right? It's, it's the first thing. But it uh, sounds like kind of a joke, but it's so frequent, right, uh, case. Uh, in reality, right, you really need to uh, 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 seek for investors who understand your market, your kind of potential market, your, your products, right? Uh, and uh, we have some network, right? He has some kind of uh, 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 knowledge, understanding, and the people, right, who can help you, right? And, and uh, then if you are successful to get that type of investor, probably you can get much more value from this kind of knowledge of your investor compared to money uh, investor is giving you. And 
typically that, that value is almost for free, right? Which, which come of investors' knowledge, right? So, um, so the sooner you have the product manager in the process, the greater the chance of well, success. Well, sooner you have in good investor, right? More chances you have, right, uh, 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 to, to succeed. And, and the thing about if nobody uh, from investment kind of uh, uh, community, which is in your area, is interested in you, right? Think twice, should you go somewhere else to seek money? Right? So that would be my, my recommendation. Do you have any examples related to Thermo Fisher's Baltics or Fermentas where you added yeah, the business? I can talk more about Fermentas, right? Thermo Fisher is, is, is too big <laughs> and too, too well established uh, organization. Fermentas time, we um, kind of about, you know, three years before we were acquired by Thermo Fisher, we um, decided to take investor from Boston. That was not a big fund, but mm. uh, really focusing into uh, biotech and pharma uh, space. Right? And the uh, uh, thing is what we got actually people who really kind of had the broad network in, uh, in uh, Wall Street, right? And uh, because we were thinking about strategic partner, right? Uh, thinking about our future. And uh, funny enough, right? We got uh, 50, 30 million, right? Of, uh, of cash from investor. They became a kind of significant minority investor. Mm. And uh, we are looking for a project, right? To use this money in a wise way, but uh, it didn't happen, right? Mm. They found a strategic partner faster when, when we kind of uh, had the project. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I can tell you, right, uh, from Thermo Fisher, right, uh, kind of standpoint, acquisition of Fermentas was one of the best we did mm. in, in the whole history. And Thermo Fisher acquired hundreds of companies, right? So that's a result of exactly kind of uh, having an investor who brings huge value, right? Not only money. Mr. Zilberman, would you uh, agree that money is kind of secondary? I don't want to necessarily say secondary, but first, find the investor who understands the market. Do you completely agree or disagree with that idea? Well, uh, my, my feeling is that there are three main elements in any company. First is understanding the subject matter. Secondly, understanding of finance, mm. being able to find investment or government program or anything else. And thirdly, having an element of understanding uh, the demand and how the system works. So you can have a supply chain that can evolve all the time. One of the most important, uh, I'll give two examples. One example is Apple. Mm. So if you look at Apple, Apple in the beginning was a very small company. They produced a product and they sold it to a small number of people. And then other people realized, man, these guys have something great, so let's invest in it. So they, uh, they grew again. They were producing domestically. At a certain point, they realized we are too big, the best thing, let someone else produce and we will design the product. Then they realized, okay, we are... More, more emphasized in California, everyone else emphasized the business sector, they decided to emphasize the consumer. This was an incredible vision. Later on, after many years, they realized we are going very fast and we market through all the retail stores. And then they realized our biggest constraint is that we don't really have our unique market talent. So they pivoted and they developed the, pivot, the Apple store. So having the situation did their, their, uh, mark, then the credit system evolved with the company. They changed their marketing system with the company. To me, Steve Jobs was the biggest genius when it, in developing supply chain because all the time he changed the product uh, mix, he changed the supply chain and he changed the marketing strategy. The next example is the pandemic. I think that the humanity deals with the pandemic extremely well. Mm. And the way that it dealt with, with that supply chain pivoted completely. Sud think about it. All over the world, suddenly you start having supply chain that provide you food to home. Suddenly people start digi uh, digitalizing a lot, of, uh, a, a, lot, a lot of the food system. 
supermarkets that never wanted full uh, computers start using computers. Now, this software existed a long time before, but at a certain time, people realized, gosh, we have this opportunity, and they were able to convince investors, even bank and government, to have this type of pivot. So to some extent, having people that understand your business and understand how you can change your activity and give you the money is very crucial. Now, when you have investors that only look at rate of return and don't understand what you are doing, you are in trouble because a lot of time it's better not to spend money because if you don't have the opportunity. But the key in any business is to be opportunistic and the, the moment to care, you have to move forward. I have a lot of examples in the pandemic. Walmart, which was a very sleepy company, they moved with digitization during the pandemic, they captured a lot of parts of the world. Other companies went bankrupt. Mm. So to me, understanding what's going on, having the good timing, and helping to go the right direction is important. But when we say that we need to think differently about policies, what about the government? What is the government role in the um, supply chain? Okay, I, I think, that first of all, I think that people always say government cannot, uh, cannot lose winners. I don't think the private sector is good in losing winners. I work with a lot of companies and they were, the government a lot of time need to have first some mechanism to, for, to support finance during the value of death. For example, in Israel, that one of the good things, they have a investment authorities that after companies start, in the period of development, they can get some support from the government. Secondly, in certain areas, the government needs to do the research and to be coordinating of what's going on. I think, look at example of, uh, for example, of uh, solar energy. If it wasn't for a lot of the research that the government did and supported in developing some of the solar energy and coordination, it wouldn't have happened. I work, for example, in, in uh, hydrogen. All the oil companies need the government to say, okay, how we build the supply chain of hydrogen and supply chain of machinery that work on it. The government has a role in coordinating, providing information, and sometimes even providing a credit. I worked with Shell Oil, I worked with BP, I worked with some big companies. They are huge, but they don't know what they are doing when they come outside of area of expertise. The government, they go to the government to give them some guidance, which shocked me, mm. but that's the reality. So a lot of time, if you have some expertise, the government, OECD, whatever, can help you to, to set your direction. So to me, public-private collaboration and government providing finance in the right moment can make a huge difference. And Mr. Markowskis, how is the Lithuanian government doing in that regard? Uh, as always, uh, it, it could be better, right? <laughs> say, say that way. And uh, yeah, I guess step-by-step uh, step we are coming to understanding, right, about uh, what... Uh, what means global versus Lithuania, right? And uh, kind of what we will not succeed without being part of a of, of big international network, right? Question is how to achieve that, right? And, uh, and I guess, uh, um, again, I mean, from global model, when you look actually to specific actions you need to make every day, right, again, we are coming to practicalities, right? And just as a small example, right, about it's what I'm observing is interesting enough, even mid-sized companies in Lithuania, they don't have product managers, mm -hmm. right? What, what that means, that means that uh, uh, top managers of a company think that they understand market well enough, right? They know about their products well, about competitors, I mean, enough of things, right, they could be successful. But the problem is, right, they, they have not, not enough of time really kind of dig and understand the competition, right, understand their own products, requirements, and especially actually what's the next step, what next product should be launched, right, what's the market trend. So it's a full-time job. And if they don't have that position, right, uh, more important thing is we don't have dialogue, right, between uh, uh, somebody who is really digging deep and who is making business decisions, mm -hmm. right? 
So lack of web dialogue is typically uh, leading companies to uh, very difficult positions. And, and it's not only company. If you look actually to universities, every university typically has so-called technology transfer office. Who sits in that office? IP lawyers, right? And typically, we don't have anyone, right, uh, who is uh, thinking about kind of developments or R&D programs a university have, right, from market standpoint, right? Who could advise uh, actually scientists and, and have dialogue, right, inside? So it's the same thing, uh, right, uh, Fermentas at that time was one of the first companies in the world who really introduced actually stage gate system, right? Which Robert Cooper proposed, right? And the uh, essence of that is, right, you need to split your development process, right, up to you launch product into logical steps and put gates in between with requirements. And interesting enough, owners of the gates cannot be R&D people, mm. right? So by that, you have dialogue, right? So dialogue, 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 right? Uh, holistic view, dialogue, having access to professionals. And not necessarily you have people inside of a company, right? You, you may get uh, uh, knowledge and, and experience, right? And access people who are not part of your company. So you're essentially saying that companies need more product managers and research organizations uh, for need a, someone for who would... Product manager is just one example, right? Of, uh, of a whole value... Uh, uh, stream and yeah. or but research organizations it. also uh, need people who understand the research ma market, exactly. right? Exactly. Uh, Let me grab. Uh, I was working uh, on with the University of California, Berkeley, and Stanford on the offices of technology transfer. What happened in Stanford? It was a bad office. Till they have a guy his name was Reimer. What did he do the first thing? He fired all the lawyers mm -hmm. and he said, only engineers and technologists will be in the office. And when you have a problem, we hire a lawyer because lawyers are like contraceptives. They say no all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and then they start thinking about it. <laughs> and so you really need people that are enabling rather than people that are preventing things from, uh, from happening. And so to some extent, I think that is the key, to have people that basically know the business and the technology. And this is the role of the university, to introduce people along this line and they understand the spirit of the law and they realize that the issue is not to avoid risk, but to take risk smartly. Mm -hmm. And you don't to say what happened in the worst case scenario, but look at a situation that you balance benefit and risk. I think that people don't think, the companies that think this way are very successful. So to me, avoiding this risk aversion, like in Europe, later on we'll speak, we have the precautionary principle. If you don't take, only dead people don't take risk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so to some extent, you really need to be able to develop mechanisms to deal with risk. There is a very interesting question in the audience as well. What do consumers tell you in these times? And mm. I think this will be for both mm. of you. How have their needs changed uh, in, over the decades and how uh, hungry are they for innovation? I, I think, think about uh, Steve Jobs, okay? A lot of time consumers can see beyond, cannot see much beyond their nose. So a lot of time, if you have a new technology, you need someone that comes with this idea of what's called user-friendly, that, 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 that basically develop new products for consumer. So again, product developer, you need to look what consumer like, what are the characteristics of the, 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 their desire, what are the properties that make life better. But a lot of time you have to dream about this type of uh, product that will make people happy. I'll give you an example, computer games. Computer games, when they started, they were nothing. Now they are a, they are a, huge, they are a huge thing. All the lifestyle is really changing. So to some extent, what you do is you throw ideas, get feedback for computer, improve your product. The other thing is, if you have a new design, a lot of time it may take 20 years till it will go to the co consumer. 
the product doesn't fit the nerds that design it because there are five of them and they are not normal anyhow. The product needs to fit the consumer that are not that sophisticated and can use it. So to some extent, a lot of time, it's up to you to come with ideas and then to educate the consumer. Now, obvious needs are very easy to communicate, but the big breakthrough is when you come with new solutions and uh, with new products. Mr. Markaskas, would you have anything to add on this? Uh, not much, actually. <laughs> it's difficult, right, to, to kind of uh, say something in addition to, to David's uh, uh, understanding, right? But the uh, thing is, right, uh, uh, nothing is impossible, right? That's, uh, and uh, that kind of discussion, what we are a small country, right, and uh, how we fit actually to big world networks and so on and so forth, right? I guess uh, uh, that is wrong, um, wrong view, right? Thing is, right, but if we take Vilnius Kaunas, right, which is uh, about one million people, right, uh, with a uh, few pretty decently good universities, I would say, still uh, 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 it's uh, space to improve. Right, and and that is that is megapolis, right, for 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 developments, right, and that megapolis could be and should be in a network of of world network. It's nothing about borders of of Lithuania or or small cities, whatever, right, and good good example, right, through pandemic, Thermo Fisher, right, in in one year we hired a thousand people to make uh, 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 tests and, and components for vaccines, right, for a world. It's uh, 1,000 people here in Lithuania. 1,000 people here in Lithuania, right? While if, uh, say, uh, we have kind of factory in Rockford, right, in US, which is one hour drive from, from Chicago, right? And if uh, uh, our Rockford colleagues would uh, have that task to hire 1,000 people, that wouldn't happen, right? So, and, and that's close to Chicago, right? So it's, uh, it's, uh, we, we, we should see uh, uh, Lithuania not as a country, we should see our, our megapolis, right? Uh, and, uh, and concentrate on them. Which brings us to the final uh, question from the audience and the next one uh, about the Lithuania's positioning in the biotech supply chain. How should we position ourselves globally and are we ready for the next, uh, next big breakthrough, a great uh, success story like Fermentas? Uh, Fermentas is kind of, you, you cannot go twice in the same river. <laughs> so let's, let's not be naive. That time was very different. Uh, situation and and so on and so forth and uh, um, we already in, in in that network right question is I mean uh, about uh, another big partner like Thermo Fisher right uh, uh, to be ready to provide supply chain <laughs> mm. right but uh, super important thing is again when we look to investment to research Mm -hmm. we are still not doing well, right? For a strange reason, we somehow became like uh, very rational when, rational, when we think about investment to research, we are expecting to add one dollar and to get two tomorrow, right? Which, which is not actually, investment to research, first of all, is investment into people, mm -hmm. right? We somehow think that universities could become like companies, right? Uh, get investment and, and produce profit immediately. Profit is not a business uh, university should do, right? So when we look to statistics, right? Uh, Lithuania is, uh, is somewhere in average of, of EU, well, we speak about uh, how many researchers we have, uh, uh, per 100,000 people in Lithuania. But when we kind of uh, uh, look postdoctoral studies, right, we are at the bottom. So 
what that means. That means that universities feed themselves pretty well mm. with new scientists, but nothing goes to industry. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that is a problem, right? We need more postdoctoral uh, uh, positions, uh, but at least half of them, right, leaving university and working for industry. Mm-hmm. Why is that so important? Investment into research. How would you encourage Lithuania to foster that? The, I think that, this, that Lithuania, I thought about it. The first one I heard about Lithuania was by Tlerunas Mokselonas. And I asked myself, God, how come a small country like this had such excellent players? And everyone knows that uh, about... And the reason is that you took local talent and you gave them all the training and all the basic fundamental and you emphasize two things, excellence and relevance. So a lot of time when you speak about university, you speak about special ed for people of limited ability. But you need special ed for your talent. You have to identify your talent and you have to direct them to research that is both frontier but also practical. So to me, a lot of the challenge is to develop the universities and the high school that prevent people that are capable. And in most of the world, it doesn't it happen. So to some extent, even if you have two or three programs throughout the country that produce 300 people that are top notch in biology, that would be very important. So you have to think about strategically. Mm. You, have, you have a company that is very good. You have some people that have capacity, emphasize it, and always go to the top. The first rule about science uh, is that generally, number one is a lot of time taking everything. So you try to have one or two areas of excellence and develop a research system that, that, that is doing it. And the good thing is that you have foundation and you have self-confidence. The best thing about Lithuania is that you have one or two success stories that you can build on it. Because I go to a lot of other countries and say, look, how can we do it? We never did it before. You have done it. So now it's much better to have the third success than the first one. I think we will hear some of the success stories in the next panel debate, which will concentrate on uh, startups. And we have sort of uh, singled out the advice for startups. Uh, One of them was mm, only dead people (laughs) don't risk, right? And then we have also said that uh, look for investors who understand the market rather than, you know, look at the money primarily. Uh, Just to take us to the next discussion, what else? What are the highlights that, you know, what is the advice, not just to startups, but maybe to business in general? What are the emphasis that you would uh, put on what we have said? Just to summarize this. I think the key element is knowledge, being able to get money, develop management that is uh, multi, uh, multidisciplinary and be persistent. Don't give up. Very good, uh, Mr. Markas. And uh, have constant dialogue with people around the world who understand things. <laughs> dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.